Hi folks, I'm back with part four of this intercalation series and I want to start with a, another update. Now, um, as simple as this intercalation process is, I doubt very seriously that I'm doing it uh, perfectly already and the probabilities are that I'm not. And one of the things that I've learned uh, so far is that it gets progressively harder to remove the water from uh, your intercalated uh, graphite and you can boil off the, the most of it but uh, I think a better approach would actually be not to add any extra water to it and then you don't have to worry about getting it out okay so with that in mind what I've done here is I only had about 50 60 milliliters of, uh, of 85 percent uh, phosphoric acid left so I dumped it all in this flask and I'm redoing the intercalation again and then I and then I uh, dumped a tablespoon of of uh, graphite in there. So basically, what I'm doing, I'm going to stir this on the magnetic stirrer all night uh, with low heat on it, and uh, should shouldn't lose any uh, water because there's no extra water in it. And so uh, anyway, we'll do. I'm going to do that, and then tomorrow I can start uh, testing this uh, this stuff here. Now, since I ran out of phosphoric acid, I made a trip to town today, and uh, electron, proton, neutron suggested uh, uh, that you go to an auto supply place to get phosphoric acid, and he was right. I went to, uh, um, oh, I forget which one it was, um, but one of the auto supply places, I visited several of them, and I, I found this uh, rust-oleum, rust, rust dissolver in here. And I actually, I found a lot of products that had phosphoric acid in it, but this one was the only one that that had the only ingredients listed is phosphoric acid. So, and I, I have no idea what the concentration of this is. I doubt it's 85 percent, but um, it's it's probably fairly strong. Uh, it says diluted down for a lot of purposes, and uh, so anyway, I've got a gallon of it, and I got it for 24 dollars which is a hell of a lot cheaper than you can buy um, uh, phosphoric acid from a chemical supply place. Um, I'll be back with uh, something else here shortly. Alright, this is the uh, first batch of intercalated uh, graphite that I made. And uh, what I did with this was I poured off the, uh, the excess uh, graphite uh, liquid that was in there and so it just left the uh, solidified stuff in the bottom of it and then I uh, put some distilled water in there and rehydrated all that and uh, now I'm uh, now I'm sonicating it and uh, it's, it's had about a half hour of sonication and I'm going to sonicate it some more and then I'll see we'll see how that turns out. Now I want to talk about the um, chemistry of the cell in relationship to the intercalation and exfoliation process. And I want to say up front that I'm not a chemistry expert or even a battery expert for that matter. Uh, but I do have a basic understanding of the principles of chemistry and that's more important than the details. Details become important in the application of the principles. This first picture here is a diagram of the phosphoric acid uh, molecule. And the thing to note here is the structure of it. It has a phosphorus atom in the middle surrounded by four oxygen atoms which have three hydrogen atoms uh, bonded to that. This picture on the other hand is a diagram of trisodium phosphate and as you can see it has exactly the same physical structure as the phosphoric acid. The only difference is that we've you've substituted uh, sodium for the hydrogen. Now we come to boric acid, and this is where it starts to get interesting. Notice that it has a very similar uh, physical structure to phosphoric acid and trisodium phosphate. The only thing that's missing is the extra uh, oxygen atoms. Now this is a uh, diagram of the borax molecule, a single molecule. Now notice how big it is. It's huge. And notice all the binding sites it has all over it. And that's why it's such a good linking agent is because of its size and it has a zillion binding sites so it can pretty much bind with anything. Okay now all the red dots in there are oxygen 
and all the white dots in the diagram are hydrogen. The combination of those two is, of course, the water that's tied up in the borax molecule. And there's a lot of water tied up in there. And now what's holding all that, that whole molecule together right there? If you look at it closely, you'll see that it's the sodium, and that's the little purple dots in there. So now if we, if we take out that sodium, what happens to the borax molecule? It all breaks down into six groups of boric acid molecules that are bound together. Now this is a diagram of the boric acid structure that forms uh, when you remove all the sodium from borax. And the thing to notice here is the hexagonal uh, ring structure that forms when all the uh, hydroxide uh, link together. Now that hexagonal ring structure right there is in a two-dimensional plane. And guess what molecule fits right on top of that hexagonal ring structure? If you guessed graphite, you guessed correct. Now this picture comes from a uh, article in Wikipedia about boric acid and there are several things I want to point out on this page. Now the first thing I want to point out is the two chemical uh, equations at the top of the page. Notice that they're uh, reversible reactions and the predominant direction of the, of the reaction is towards the formation of water. And now also notice that you can drive that reaction, the top reaction there, under drier conditions in the opposite direction and actually generate some uh, hydrogen. And I think we can use that to our advantage in the biocell. Now the next thing I want to point out is the confusion and the debate of whether boric acid is a uh, Lewis acid or a Bronsted acid. And the truth is that it doesn't have to be one or the other, it can be both. Now, in Dr. Tomek's, uh, Malik's presentation on intercalation and exfoliation, he makes the point that uh, he uses Bronsted acids for his intercalation. Now, notice in the uh, next three equations that boric acid has successive uh, ionization stages at different pH levels, just like uh, phosphoric acid does. Now, notice the last paragraph about polyborate anions and the critical salt concentration. In this slide, notice the highlighted area from the same article in uh, Wikipedia. Now this is some important information right here and I'm not sure yet whether the fact that we're using alcohol in the cell is, a, is good or bad because there are trade-offs involved. Um, oxidation is the main power of production in the cell, but at the same time too much oxidation is going to it's going to shut the cell down, and you'll have to clean it a lot uh, more often. Now we come to the titanium dioxide molecule, and this is the rutile form here, which is the form that we're using. And this uh, structure is so strong and stable that if you convert one of the other forms of titanium dioxide into this form here, it's irreversible. You can't take it back. Now notice that the oxygen in the uh, molecule is all tied up inside of the cubic uh, titanium structure where it has a hard time binding with anything. The most available binding sites are the two oxygens at the top of the molecule and the two oxygens at the bottom of the molecule. And I suspect that what happens is with the water uh, binds with those two uh, oxygen and somehow rips the molecule, the water molecule apart and creating uh, hydrogen and, uh, and hydroxide. Okay, now let's talk about the practical aspects of uh, using this information in the battery. <coughs> so, there's no reason that we can't use the, the charge separation that the battery provides in the chemical reaction chamber to actually perform the redox reactions that we need to transform our interplated uh, graphite over here and, and make different products inside of that. Okay, And if we do that, then we can take advantage of the self-assembly 
of this uh, interclation and exfoliation uh, system. Okay, so uh, we in the last uh, battery build, I used uh, TSP here, and we tried that, and we showed that it produced a good uh, good battery. But we also got uh, options to use borax here or boric acid. And uh, now let's let's consider if we use boric acid here, and this is the reaction up here for phosphoric acid combined with boric acid and and, it, and that reaction goes to uh, borate phosphate which uh, which is this molecule right here plus three uh, water molecules are formed okay and this is a and you can see that basically you're just switching you're removing three hydrogens here from the phosphoric acid and, and you're substituting the boron for the phosphoric for the three hydrogens so if you take that over to here then what we would do by using boric acid in here, we would be moving the boron from this membrane over into here, and it would intercalate uh, inside of, uh, of this uh, material here, the graphite. So there's no problem with that reaction working, I'm sure. Now let's now let's look at uh, if what happens if we combine phosphoric acid with borax. Okay, and if you do that, the very first thing that forms is sodium borate uh, phosphate, which is actually two different molecules. Because remember, we're, we're breaking up our our borax uh, big molecule, and and we get smaller. Some smaller molecules are formed from that, and and one of the the, the smaller molecules that forms is trisodium phosphate. So what happens over here is our our our, pho our phosphoric acid. The hydrogen get replaced again, but this time with sodium. Okay, so what would happen if you use this? If you put the borax in there instead of the boric acid, you would end up moving the sodium from here over to here. Okay, so there's there's two different ways to move different uh, uh, atoms uh, into uh, the substitution reaction over here. So if we use to recap it there, if we use boric acid. We're going to move boron from here to here. If we use borax, and we're going to move, uh, we're going to move sodium from here to here, and convert this into trisodium phosphate. So now, the, so I'm going to try both of these, and we're going to see uh, what the results are, and then we'll just go with uh, whichever one performs the best. Alrighty, I'm back. And uh, I don't have time to uh, build another battery and test it on this video. So I'm going to use the last couple of minutes here just to uh, catch up on a, a couple of things. Uh, this is the first uh, interclated graphite that I made and uh, that I uh, re-dissolved in water and then sonicated. And this has probably had like an hour and a half of uh, sonication so far. And I took a little bit of it on a brush and, and dipped it in this water here and you can see that it's... Uh, there's stuff in there. You can see a little, a little bit of settling out at the bottom of it too. We're going to shine the laser from this uh, infrared heat gun or thermometer in there. And you see the, see the laser shining through that. Test it again after a while and see uh, how long it stays in suspension. Now this is the new stuff right here that I've done, and and I've stirred this. Uh, on the magnetic stir for about 16 hours and it's just straight sulfuric acid and graphite and uh, and so I've, and I've also painted both of these this is number one on here and I painted number two right here I'm gonna let it soak in and uh, dry and then I'll um, buff those surfaces right there and, and see what kind of uh, uh, resistance we get on that after that so I'm back with one more real quick update before I close this is their uh, interclade to graphite that I uh, exfoliated by rehydrating it and as you can see it's been setting now for 24 hours and everything is settled out except for the the graphene in there and you can see the light shining right through that so I guess that's it for this video and thanks for watching